Turning and turning in the widening gyre, the falcon cannot hear the falconer. Things fall apart, the center cannot hold. Um, this was sent to me this week. Um, this is Yeats, um, The Second Coming. It came out almost exactly 100 years ago in the midst of World War I. Somehow seemed apt. Um, I think maybe like me, you're looking for places with a sense of progress and hope. And uh, my hope tonight is that you leave with a sense that Reed is such a place. So welcome. I'm Hugh Porter. Um, I think most of you know my background. I came to Reed in 1998. I oversaw external relations, um, so fundraising, communications, alumni relations, and more recently, Center for Life Beyond Reed. Um, one of my jobs was actually to decide when the college closes for snow, so I'm glad we've had a <laughs> milder winter. It's actually a very big decision and no one's happy. Um, prior to that, um, I was a cellist, I do still play, and a music historian, so um, that's me. So I've worked at Reed for these many years because I think it's a remarkable institution, um, one that plays an important role, I think, in overall higher education in America, as well as um, completing its chief responsibility of educating undergraduates. In our current accreditation effort, we've had the chance to reflect on the college's design and its accomplishments, and Mandy's looking at me trying to remind me to tell you that we are filming this. Um, and uh, so we won't have you in the film, however, so it'll just be Mary and me on tape. Mary and I have done this event around the country a number of times, and we just can't let it go. Or we need to have it memorialized, for, so <laughs> that's what we're doing. In any case, we've been in an accrediting effort here, um, and two words drawn from the college's mission statement have important, been important to that, rigor and independence, and a new concept, that of supporting students in their academic work frame our report. This is a narrower and deeper commitment than most of our peer schools and one that's allowed Reed to focus its resources. Prior to this accreditation effort, we've engaged in a significant strategic planning effort and I wanted to give you a brief update on where we are, where we've been, and what we hope to accomplish, and then I'll introduce Mary. The, uh, <clears throat> the uh, strategic planning effort was launched in 2012 with 11 working groups of faculty, staff, students, and trustees. We had three groups of alumni, um, parents, and friends working in parallel. There were at least 188 recommendations. Um, we've made good progress on a lot of them. Many required more time than money, honestly. And I think we're really feeling very good about where we are in that progress. Uh, in that time, and very importantly, the college has also reestablished its strength after the 2008 downturn. This downturn, unfortunately, turns out to be a tidal wave of bad news for a lot of institu uh, institutions of higher education. Many of you probably noticed that Merrill Hurst University closed. It was a place I loved very much. Um, my wife was here taught there. Um, and it's sad to see it go. And I just read today that Hampshire College, a wonderful place, is debating whether or not it can admit a freshman class. So, so it's truly wonderful that Reed has, has bounced back. Um, the endowments were covered through um, generous gifts and investment performance um, and has been able to accomplish its chief mission of providing need-based financial aid. We've even tackled significant um, physical plant uh, projects, notably the Cross Canyon residence halls, the tennis shoes no longer melt to the floors. It's a great improvement. So <laughs> go walk, go walk by those on your way out. Since 1988. Since, yep, yeah, thank you. Uh, over these years, the college has also stabilized its enrollment picture. Um, Reed um, always had wonderful students, but we honestly were admitting just about every applicant. Um, and we've, uh, those applications have now doubled from about 3,000 a decade ago to about 6,000 now. So a very healthy picture. In Portland setting, it's useful to report that the college has uh, made stronger relationships with our host city. Part of that is, of course, Portland's moved to the left um, quite a bit, um, even since I've been here. Um, and uh, part of it is that I think we understand very much our role and the benefits of being in such an amazing place. 
Um, and there are sort of several different things that we focus on. Number one, we have a core of trustees from Portland, some of them here tonight. Um, number two, we've developed relationships to enhance um, K-12 education in Portland. Um, I think predominantly effort there would be our uh, science outreach program, but there are other programs as well. Um, we've paid a lot of attention to our local neighborhoods. That is often where the friction points are with institutions of higher education. We intersect with four neighborhood associations. And part of what we've done there is um, we've launched a, a, a wonderful effort, a 5K run that we sponsor that supports local K-8 schools. We have families from all over the neighborhoods come and run on campus. So it's just, and we serve pancakes, so it's great. Um, and we, uh, we have important relationships with artistic organizations in Portland that have been strengthened through our new performing arts building. Chamber Music Northwest is one example. Um, White Bird Dance is another, many theater companies. And those both, we're helping them and they're helping educate our students. So a virtuous circle. So a much more positive, productive relationship with Portland. I don't think you need to just take my assessment, at least not this week, for, for Reed. We actually just were up last week. I was up with the um, Regional Accrediting Board, which is actually a very big deal. Um, and it was fun to hear from them because they were really very positive about col the college. And I wanted to just, there were sort of six things they said um, to us that I thought were distinctive and give you a sense of how other people in the Pacific Northwest see Reed. So number one, they were um, very pleased to see our admission success. That's a huge challenge for many institutions right now. Number two, um, they were amazed at the faculty ownership and responsibility for the curriculum, and they were worried it wouldn't work out, but I assured them it does. Um, number three, um, the growth of a very large team of people across the, the institution and led by student services, our care team, who meet together to, uh, regularly to discuss students known to be struggling. Number four, our financial stewardship. Number five, our efforts to maintain a common freshman educational experience through, through, through Hume 110. And number six, our ability to sustain momentum during a transitional time. So looking to the future, three big areas, they won't be surprising, student success, the strength of the academic program, and access. So in student success, um, this is of course Reed's most fundamental responsibility. Um, and sort of uh, a couple big words here to begin with. Number one, belonging. Um, Reed felt vaguely familiar to me when I got here and I couldn't quite figure out why I didn't attend a liberal arts college. Um, and I, but I was a musician and I was sort of spent a lot of time in conservatory environments and I, I said, okay, this is kind of like a music conservatory. Everybody's wandering around whether they have it. You know, are they smart enough? Or they, they were the admissions mistake? Or surely everybody else understands this class but me. Um, so there's some sense, I think, that, that we were concerned that students don't feel a sense of belonging. I've even heard um, Mary say she's run into juniors who say, I'm, I'm still not sure I belong here. Um, so that's, that's something we need to, to address. And one piece of that is a vibrant community both in the academic program and beyond the academic program. Part of that's about a residential community, something that Reed has been working at bit by bit by bit for a very long time. Uh, when I arrived at Reed in 98, 50% um, of the students could choose to live on campus. Every year, more students want to, want to live on campus. Part of that's, of course, what's happening in the, the residential real estate market here in Portland. And part of that's, I think, what you get when you live on campus. And that's the reason for a brand new residence hall that you can see there on the north end of campus, one of our largest physical plant projects in many decades, 180 beds, um, is going up right now. Second thing we're thinking about a lot with student success is outcomes, um, how to help students build their capacity to think about what's next early in their time at Reed. This is probably the most uh, consistent criticism I've had, especially from graduates in the 90s. Boy, those first few years were really tough. I didn't quite know how to navigate it. And so we've paid attention. Um, the Center for Life Beyond Reed is really a fundamentally built, rebuilt organization. It's operated out of Prexy. I urge all of you to stop by. Our Portland friends are especially important um, 
to helping students, you're right here. Um, we are now doing on-campus recruitment, I would say for the first time in a significant way. Um, we've had Microsoft, Intel, Apple, the City of Portland, Multnomah County, Peace Corps, Planned Parenthood, Apex Clearing, Cascade Data Labs, Urban Airship, Simple, Bowley Welsh, that's just an incomplete list. Um, Portland Business Journal published a list of 28 Oregon companies hiring like mad and at least 15 of those have been to campus. So that really is a big change. Um, Alice Harris, the director of the center, I, I told her, Alice, you're the only place with rules on campus. And her, you know, so a student will come in and say, I, I, I need to, I wanna interview for this job. And she says, okay, two requirements, you gotta show me what we're gonna wear and you have to show me your resume. <laughs> Um, and so we have folks walking around dressed up for interviews. It's, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a change. Um, um, number two, strength of the academic program. Um, so a brief aside here, um, it's you know, permanent ranking seasons. And as I think all of you remember, Reed declines to participate in rankings that aggregate lots of different factors and purport to come up with a list of the best and the worst. Um, but we do pay attention to, you know, specific criteria and we pay attention to where we rank in certain areas that we care deeply about. And I took a look at two things um, that certainly, you know, from my perspective, like trying to oversee this budget for a year um, are hugely important um, and are hugely important in the way we think about the college. And number one is uh, percentage of full-time faculty teaching and number two, is the percentage of, uh, I'm sorry, the size of classes under 20. In those two areas, um, percentage of full-time teaching faculty and classes under 20, Reed ranks with the very wealthiest institutions in the country. It's a remarkable factor. And if you add a third factor, which is percentage of students um, receiving who are Pell eligible, so from the poorest families, um, we also rank with some of the wealthiest institutions in the country. And those three factors account for a huge amount of where we spend money and how we try and raise money. So just, just an aside about strength of the academic program. So three big areas that we've been thinking about. Number one, introductory curriculum. I know a number of you are probably skeptical about changes to the Hume curriculum. I'd urge you to give it a chance. Um, try this version out. Um, we'll publish a reading list soon, I hope. Um, we can all dig into that. Um, the Mellon Foundation, which is one of the premier uh, humanities organizations in the world, um, was delighted to help us accomplish change, not because they wanted to necessarily throw out the old curriculum, but they were just delighted that we were hanging on to this idea that we would have a common freshman experience in the humanities. It's increasingly unusual. That's the thing we need to hold on to, in my opinion. Um, you've heard less about introductory science. We have a lot of scientists here, especially physicists, very intimidating. Um, so you can, ask them, you can ask them questions about the introductory science curriculum, but I think we've really made some important changes. It was the one part of the, the curriculum where you would, could run into pretty large classes, um, and we often found that when people were leaving Reed, it's in those first two years. So we spent a lot of time, the scientists have spent a lot of time thinking about the introductory curriculum. We've been able to make some investments with um, donors' help in adding scientists to the faculty, and we hope to continue that. Um, the faculty are also thinking broadly about the overall shape of the curriculum. We have new um, general education distribution requirements that were advised by the student uh, advisory group to CAPP that I are wonderful and lucid and clear and pretty, kind, pretty exciting. Um, so you can read about those online in the catalog. Um, the second thing the faculty have been thinking deeply about is where does the curriculum expand and why? We have five new majors that you've heard a fair amount about, um, computer science, environmental studies, comparative literature, dance, um, comparative race and ethnic studies, and we've just made our hire for a new faculty member in that field. The biggest growth in terms of student movement has been, like in many places, towards um, things that could be loosely aggregated as data sciences, statistics, where we now have two faculty, soon to be three, computer science, where we ha now have three faculty, soon to be four, um, and we have a computational biologist at well. So that's a 
that's a big change that you know reads late to that party, but um, but in earnest we are there. Third area in the academic strength is research. Um, so faculty research was really changed and boosted through the efforts of the $200 million campaign that uh, completed in 2012. Um, I think faculty who come to read expect to be teachers and they expect to be research active. Um, and we're seeing that in terms of their grant support. Um, last year, Anna Ritz, the computational biologist, won a $1 million NSF career grant. And just one example. Um, you might have seen that Kim Clausing just published a book on a globalization called Open, one recommended by Larry Summers and others. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a great book. And I think it's the kind of book that might only be produced at Reed. Maybe I'm wrong about that. But it's both incredibly intellectually strong and very didactic. It's the kind of thing produced by a scholar who is a teacher. Um, so I think we're going to have distinctive outputs from this research work. And of course, a lot of that research involves students. Um, last year, in aggregate, the, student, the um, faculty received $1.7 million in external grant work. And mostly, they're hiring students and hiring themselves to do work. So we have, uh, I think, about 100 students each summer now working with faculty on campus. We're hoping to have sort of a research campus um, here in the summer. Uh, my final piece is to just say a few things about access. I think I ended up in the job that I used to have because of this question, this, this fundamentally weird American idea that talent lies in all strata of society and that one of the goals of American higher education is to lift that talent up to allow it to make a difference in the world. It's um, a huge commitment that Reed made, has made from its founding day and it's um, an ever-present effort. Um, our, our endowment right now close to 600 million just about everything we, that's produced by that in terms of income is spent on financial aid. So, um, The second aspect of access is really Mary's topic, and this is once these students here are here, do they feel supported, do they feel included? Um, and I think it's fair to, rec to realize that for many uh, students coming from backgrounds that are not traditional for Reed, um, from families who've never had anybody who's um, gone to college, this place is very foreign indeed. Um, these include growing numbers of international students, now about 10% of the student body, those from low socioeconomic backgrounds, and students from historically marginalized groups. Um, Mary's going to speak more about that, but I guess one thing I want to say, we've also thought about this from the teaching standpoint, and we've, um, with donor funding, created the Center for Teaching and Learning, something that Mary oversees, which recognizes that teaching this wide range of students is, is you're not born with. You, you, might, you might want some help. And so that's what that, that center is designed to do.